beavers. Uh, and Ben Goldfarb, I can tell you, is a very enthusiastic beaver person. Uh, he's the author of Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. He is a science writer. He's winner of the 2019 Pat E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. Uh, his work has appeared in a variety of publications you're all familiar with, Atlantic, Science, Orion Magazine, Washington Post. And he is coming to us from the West Coast. And uh, this is the marvelous wonders of Zoom. We could never afford to fly him out here and pay for his hotel room, um, but we can afford to have him here uh, via the West Coast. So uh, thank you so much, Ben, for being here and uh, look forward to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Lawrence, and, and to all of you for being here. Uh, as Lawrence said, I, I do um, I live in Spokane, Washington, but I lived for many years in Connecticut. So I'm honored to be uh, joining, joining you all today uh, on Zoom, if not in person. Um, so let me just share my screen here. Um, does that, are you saying that okay, Lawrence? Is that working? That looks good. Yeah, you sound good. Okay, great. Um, so today I'll be, I'll be talking about uh, working with beavers, using these kind of amazing rodents as restoration tools for healing the planet. Uh, but before we talk about how we can strategically deploy beavers to help the environment, it's important to talk about what a beaver is um, and to sort of establish some basic facts of beaver biology. So what is a beaver? Uh, of course, beavers are rodents. Uh, they're North America's largest rodent there, you know, good, an adult good sized beaver is 40 to 50 pounds. So I think they're uh, bigger than most people realize they are. Uh, and of course they're semi-aquatic rodents. They spend all of their lives living in and around water. Uh, and they've got all kinds of fantastic evolutionary adaptations for this, this very unique semi-aquatic niche they fill. Uh, they've got extraordinarily dense fur, so they've got as many individual hairs on a postage stamp size patch of skin as we have on our entire heads. So remarkably thick pelts, which of course were their downfall, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, they've got these wonderful um, webbed sort of duck-like hind feet. Uh, they're very powerful agile swimmers. Uh, they can stay underwater for up to 15 minutes, so they're, they're very good in the water. Uh, they have these kind of goggle-like eyelids. They've got a second set of transparent eyelids called nictitating membranes, which they can, uh, you know, which they can close and act as, act, act as goggles. Uh, they've got a second set of lips. This is my favorite beaver adaptation, a set of fur-lined lips like a valve that actually close behind their front teeth so they can chew and drag branches underwater without drowning. I think that's a, a really amazing uh, adaptation. Uh, and then of course, what's a, a beaver's most recognizable feature? What makes a beaver uh, a beaver? Of course, the tail, right? And the tail is this wonderful multi-purpose appendage. Uh, it's a fat storage device. So beavers actually put on fat for the winter in their tails. Uh, it's a, a kickstand while they're out on land. It's a rudder while they're swimming. Uh, it's actually a thermoregulatory organ. They've got sort of specialized blood vessels in the base of the tail, um, which they, they use to sort of keep themselves hot and cold uh, or to regulate their body temperatures. So the tail is really a, a very cool uh, appendage. And of course, it's, a, it's an alarm system. I'm sure many of you uh, have heard the whack of a beaver's tail uh, on the surface of the water at, a, at a, a pond or wetland one evening. And, and that's, of course, the beaver telling other beavers that there's a predator nearby. And in that case, the predator is probably you. Uh, and then the other wonderful beaver feature are their teeth, right? Beavers have these um, kind of remarkable chisel-like incisors. Uh, the top and bottom teeth sort of file each other down into these really nice points, uh, these chisel-like points. Uh, and beaver's teeth, as you can see in this picture, are orange. Uh, and the, the reason for that uh, is that they're actually chemically and structurally fortified with iron that beavers derive from their food. So they've got very durable, uh, powerful teeth. Um, which, of course, is important when you spend your whole life uh, cutting down trees, right? Uh, beavers chew down trees. They, they are doing that for two reasons. The first is that they're eating the cambium or the inner bark of the tree. That's kind of the sugary layer of bark that does the growing. 
uh, beavers will take just about any deciduous tree. Uh, they do tend to avoid conifers, so evergreen trees. Uh, you know, they really like sugar maple in your neck of the woods, uh, beech. You know, out here in the West Coast, it's really willow, aspen, cottonwood. Those are the kind of the big three species. But, you know, they're what scientists call choosy generalists. Um, so they've got a few species of tree that they really prefer, but they'll eat just about, again, any, any deciduous tree. And they eat lots of kind of green herbaceous vegetation as well, you know, grasses, wildflowers, uh, water lilies, cattails, that, that sort of thing. So of course, in addition to cutting down trees to eat the, the inner bark, uh, they're also using the wood as construction material. Uh, and there are two main types of beaver structure. The first, uh, of course, is the lodge. That's the, the beaver housing unit. Um, so inside the lodge, you know, you've got two to as many as eight beavers all sharing a, a space together. Uh, they're, they're very family oriented. So that's the, the kind of the mother, father, the male, female pair uh, who tend to be monogamous and, and mate for life. Uh, and then you've got the newborn kits, the baby beavers who are born uh, in the spring, the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds. So you've got three sort of year classes or generations of offspring all cohabitating the lodge together. Uh, and then during their second year, those two-year-olds will head off and look for their own territory, you know, like uh, teenagers going off to, to college or something like that. So of course, in addition to the lodge, uh, the other iconic beaver structure is the dam. Why do beavers build dams? What's the point of this unique specialized behavior? Well, a beaver on land, uh, as one biologist put it to me, is a, a fat, slow, smelly package of meat. Uh, beavers on land get eaten by, out here, you know, we have wolves. Um, so wolves, black bears, coyotes, cougars, another, another animal we've got uh, out, out on the West Coast. Uh, any, you know, any large carnivore is gonna very happily eat a beaver. Um, but because they're such wonderful swimmers, you know, beavers are much safer in the water, of course. So by building that dam, they're expanding the extent of their own habitat, right? Instead of having to walk over land to that good looking tree and maybe get eaten by a bear along the way, they can swim to it instead and be comparatively safe. And here's that, uh, this is a, this is a, uh, uh, a piece of a beaver that I found in, in, uh, in Minnesota. Um, this is a beaver that was uh, predated by a wolf and wolves actually eat, they eat the pelt, the, the, all of the bones, everything, uh, and leave behind only the mandible and, uh, and the lower incisor. So the lesson is that you don't wanna be a beaver on land. That's what happens to beavers that uh, spend too much time walking around. So a typical beaver colony or, or family, they generally build one large primary dam and then a number of smaller secondary dams uh, to kind of spread water out over, over a large area. And these dams come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, here's a, a kind of a modest uh, little dam. This is in Montana, I think. So this dam is, you know, probably three feet wide and one feet, one foot tall. Um, you know, it's a, a modest uh, secondary, secondary dam, um, but they do get uh, quite a bit bigger. Uh, here's a, a dam, uh, this is also in, in northern Minnesota um, that I visited a couple of years ago, and, and this dam is uh, probably 15 feet tall and six to 800 feet long, uh, and is obviously the result of, of many generations of beavers uh, all adding their, their stick to the pile. So when you leave them alone, uh, they, can, they can really achieve some pretty impressive things. And of course, those, those impressive dams are capturing an impressive amount of water, right? Here's a, a beaver pond. This is, this is the work of a single strategically located dam. Uh, and they've, you know, they've impounded hundreds of acres of water uh, in, this, in this forest and created a really spectacular pond and, and wetland complex. Um, so you know, they're really storing huge amounts of water at a very, a very vast scale. Now, the other important thing that beavers do that, that you know, I think we don't give them enough credit for is they, they're also very prolific diggers. They excavate these elaborate canal networks that extend hundreds of feet back into the forest. And again, that's, you know, the point of that is that they don't have to walk up into the woods. They can, they can you know, cut that canal and then swim up uh, to a good looking tree and then float it back down the canal to use in their, in their dam or, or lodge. Uh, so, you know, that's a, another really important beaver function is, is uh, excavating these elaborate canal networks uh, that really move water uh, across, across the landscape. This, this canal system is in, um, this is in Northampton, Massachusetts. So here's what it looks like when you all 
when you kind of put it all together. Um, this is a, a beaver complex in Colorado. Uh, this is at the Continental Divide at, at about 12,000 feet in the, in the, uh, the Rocky Mountains. So they really get up in elevation. And you can just see that, you know, here's the stream kind of meandering along. It's, you know, sort of this single threaded channel, uh, like a little sine wave, you know, moving through this valley. And then it reaches, you know, these, these beaver dams, all of these linear structures are beaver dams. And you can see that, you know, just thousands and thousands of gallons of water are being held in this, in this valley by this, uh, this, this pond and wetland complex that the beavers have created. So they're really, you know, hydrating this, this valley at, a, at a, a, pretty, a pretty vast scale. You know, all of this water is water that would be shooting right through this valley were beavers not keeping on the landscape. So beavers, of course, by building these, these ponds and wetlands, the point is to maximize the extent of their own habitat. But in the process, uh, they're creating habitat for all kinds of other species as well. You know, we know that life uh, congregates around water. That's true all over the world, uh, especially true out here in the American West where I live, uh, where wetlands cover just 2% of the land area, but support 80% of the, of the biodiversity. Uh, so any animal that's capable of creating more wetlands or expanding their, their area is really important, right? Biologists call beavers uh, a keystone species. And, a, and in architecture, the keystone is the top block in a stone arch. And if, we, if you remove that top block, you know, the whole arch crumbles. And similarly, uh, beavers are supporting a, a disproportionate uh, amount of, of weight in aquatic ecosystems. Uh, so there, so there, you know, there, there are all kinds of species that are benefiting from beavers. Uh, a few examples: this is a, a great blue heron rookery um, in Wisconsin, I believe, uh, that I, I visited. So all kinds of waterfowl, wading birds, you know, name a, a species of duck, uh, and there's a, a study showing that it does well uh, in the presence of beavers. And all kinds of songbirds too. You know, we don't think about terrestrial songbirds as, be, as being beaver beneficiaries, but they, they really like hanging out by water as well. You know, they're eating the aquatic insects uh, that hatch and emerge from, from beaver complexes. Uh, of course, all kinds of aquatic or semi-aquatic mammals uh, do, do well around beaver complexes. Moose are very closely associated with beavers, muskrats, mink, otters. There's a huge suite of, of, uh, of mammals uh, that do really well. Uh, here's a, a cool example. I think this is in um, this is also in Voyagers National Park in, in Minnesota. Uh, what, you, what you can see here is here's so here's here's an old beaver dam. Uh, you know all of this this kind of wet meadow used to be underwater, right? That's a historic beaver pond. The dam broke. The pond drained, uh, creating this really nice, lush, wet meadow that's really good forage for deer and and moose and other ungulates. And you can see that the beaver lodge. Uh, this giant mound here was sort of stranded in the middle of this meadow. So after that happened, uh, a pack of wolves actually moved into the lodge and raised their pups in that lodge. I think that's really incredible as beavers creating habitat for their direct predator. That's, that's remarkable to me. And then the other really important beaver beneficiary is fish, right? Beavers, beavers, of course, are expanding the extent of water. They're creating more habitat, especially for juvenile fish. This is a, a, a baby rainbow trout. Um, and if you look, if you're, if you're a little finger length trout fry or a salmon fry, uh, you know, you don't want to live in the main stem river, you're just gonna get blown downstream by a, the powerful current. You know, you wanna live in a, a deep pool or a side channel or an eddy. You want that kind of complex, slow water refuge. And that's exactly what beavers create. So there are lots and lots of studies uh, connecting beavers to enhanced fish, fish production. And, you know, out here on the West Coast, you know, rainbow trout, that's our, our, our native species. But, you know, on the East Coast, you guys have brook trout and uh, there are plenty of studies showing that beavers are good for, for brook trout as well. Uh, now, of course, the, the objection that you often hear um, from anglers and some fish biologists is, you know, wait a second, um, you know, aren't dams bad for fish, right? Uh, we're trying to take dams out of rivers right right now, not put more dams into rivers. And, uh, but of course, you know, a human dam is nothing like uh, a beaver built dam, you know, fish jump over beaver dams, they can swim through them, they can go around them during periods of high water, fish have no problem uh, getting past beaver dams. Uh, and here as, as evidence, uh, here's a picture I took near Seattle a couple of years ago. Here's the, the beaver dam uh, in the top right corner of the screen. Here's the pond behind it. And uh, here are the two freshly excavated salmon nests. 
Uh, so at least two fish had no problem whatsoever getting past this, this beaver dam. And in fact, the evolutionary connection uh, between beavers and fish, which is you know, millions of years old, is so deep that it inspired my favorite bumper sticker, which is beavers taught salmon to jump. I think that gets at the, at the connection nicely. So just how many beavers did we used to have uh, in North America? What was the kind of the historic extent of their influence on our, on our landscape? Uh, well, you know, we don't know exactly how many beavers there were uh, on this continent, but the best guess we has, that we, we have is as many as 400 million beavers uh, lived in North America prior to European colonization. So today for comparison, you know, we, we probably have about 10 million beavers uh, in North America. So, you know, they're not an endangered species. There are, you know, plenty of them, uh, but they're still at a, a tiny fraction uh, of their, their historic abundance. And of course, all of those hundreds of millions of beavers would have created hundreds of millions of beaver ponds. You know, the, here's another kind of the best back of the envelope estimate we have for, for sort of beaver pond capacity on this continent is as many as 250 million beaver ponds, uh, again, prior to European arrival. And, you know, a little, a little back of the envelope math tells you that that's, you know, perhaps 230,000 square miles that were impounded by beavers. And just for the sake of reference, uh, 235,000 square miles is about the size of Arizona and Nevada put together. Uh, so beavers just had a, a, a tremendous uh, proportion of the, the continent under underwater before we showed up, before, before Europeans showed up. So a lot of what I tried to do in, in the course of writing this book is go back through old trappers diaries and explorers journals and railroad survey reports and you know Native American oral histories trying to recreate what a fully beavered landscape looks like. You know what did what did the continent look like before we had before we lost 400 million beavers. Um, you know and, and it, it's sort of hard to say but there's no question that this was much a this was once a much bluer greener wet lush landscape. Um, you know, there are accounts of explorers crossing what is today the state of Indiana and not finding a, a dry place to camp for 100 miles because beavers had so thoroughly ponded up the landscape. Here's a, a nice observation from Meriwether Lewis, uh, of course, of Lewis and Clark fame, uh, who described, this is in, the, in the, uh, the Missouri Basin in Montana, who described seeing beaver dams in every single tributary of the Missouri, you know, as far as the eye could see uh, up to the, the base of the mountains. So that was in 1805 that Lewis and Clark made those observations of, you know, beaver dams as far as the eye could see. Uh, just 38 years later in 1843, um, John James Audubon, of course, the famous naturalist and painter, traveled the exact same route uh, looking for a beaver to paint. Uh, and he couldn't find a single beaver in all of the Missouri basin. So what happened in just four decades? Where did all the beavers go? What did they turn into? Well, of course, they turned into hats. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people hear the phrase beaver hat and they think of like a big fluffy Davy Crockett like thing, but actually beaver hats were these sort of elegant uh, Victorian style top hats that were all the rage back in, in Europe. Uh, and you know, the fur trade, the industrial fur trade really begins in the early 1600s, actually begins more or less in Connecticut uh, with the arrival of, of Adrian Block uh, and you know, pretty rapidly expands westward and south. Uh, and, you know, really by, by you know, the, the arrival of the 18th century, by 1700 or so, you know, beavers have been pretty much extirpated um, from, from New England uh, and are well on their way to being extirpated from the rest of the continent uh, as well. You know, by the early 1800s, the fur trade has reached the, the Rocky Mountains and the, and the West Coast. And, uh, you know, by the mid 1800s, beavers are, are pretty much uh, extirpated from the lower 48 states. Now it's really hard to overstate the extent to which beaver, the, the beaver trade drove early American history. You know, beavers uh, along with timber and cod were really the most important economic resource that settlers or colonists found when they arrived in, in North America. Uh, and, you know, practically- Okay, I've got it. Practically every significant event uh, prior to the Civil War has some kind of beaver connection. You know, for example, one of the, the British offenses that angered the colonists to revolt uh, was denying them access of trapping grounds west of the Appalachians. You know, the Louisiana Purchase was partly fueled by Jefferson's desire uh, to secure more trapping grounds. 
and of course smallpox and many of the diseases that ravaged many many Native American tribes uh, were spread by fur fur traders and trappers. So the story of the fur trade is really the story of of early American history and all of its you know grandeur and and tragedy. Uh, here I think is, is one good indication of uh, just how deeply embedded beavers were in early American economies. This was a beaver coin uh, minted by the Oregon Territory, which used to cover the, the entirety of the Northwest. And one beaver coin was equal to the value of one beaver pelt. So the entire economy, the whole currency, uh, operated on the, the pelt standard. I think that's pretty remarkable. So of course, in addition to being uh, a hugely significant historical event, the fur trade was also a, a hugely consequential ecological event, right? We don't think about the fur trade in the same terms as we think about the deforestation of New England or the busting of the Midwestern prairie uh, or you know, gold mining in California as being this kind of seminal ecological catastrophe that shaped the, 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 the physical landscape. But, you know, of course, when you, kill 400 million beavers, uh, you know, and, and 250 million beaver, beaver dams and ponds blow out, you know, you lose uh, a hugely important feature of the landscape. You know, I think that one amazing indication of, of how significant the fur trade was uh, is that, you know, in, in New England, after the, after beavers were eradicated, uh, so many, so many beaver ponds drained to the ocean that they fertilized an enormous plankton bloom. So today, if you take a sediment core in Long Island Sound, uh, you can actually see this layer of, of diatoms, of phytoplankton that were fertilized by all of the nutrients flooding out of these beaver ponds, uh, rushing, rushing to the ocean. I think that's, that's pretty astonishing. The, 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 the fur trade changed the landscape in, in other ways too. You know, in a, a healthy beaver rich stream, all of those beaver dams are acting like speed bumps, right? They're slowing the water down and they're spreading it out and they're pushing water uh, out onto the, the floodplain uh, of the stream. But when you lose all of those, those beaver built speed bumps, there's nothing checking the velocity of water and you get really rapid dramatic erosion. Uh, like this, this is a stream in Wyoming that, that lost its beavers and uh, experienced this kind of catastrophic erosion. And you know, this, this whole sort of upper plateau here, um, which used to be this beautiful lush wetland uh, turned into dry pasture because it, you know, it lost this connection with the stream. So there are thousands and thousands of miles of streams all over North America uh, that looked like, that look like this uh, in large part due to the elimination of beavers. And of course, there are countless species that lost critical habitat uh, when, when beavers were, were destroyed. This, for example, this is a, a boreal toad, uh, a species that we have out, out west here. And in some places, the boreal toad is a, a beaver pond obligate. So it only breeds in, in beaver ponds. Uh, you know, so what did, what did the loss of beavers mean for otters or moose or brook trout or coho salmon. You know, we'll never fully know uh, the kind of the extent of the ecological catastrophe that we suffered, but there's no question that it was uh, quite, quite the disaster. And here's just one, one good uh, indication, I think. This is a, a study from out here in Washington uh, that basically found that the, the loss of beaver ponds contributed to a 97% loss uh, in, in habitat for juvenile salmon. Uh, so that's just a kind of a remarkable indication, I think, of, of how catastrophic the, the fur trade was. So by 1900 or so, you know, the beaver population has reached its, its nadir at around 100,000 or so uh, in all of North America, nearly all of them up in Canada. There were practically no beavers left um, in the lower 48, certainly uh, none in, in New England. Uh, but, you know, fortunately, all of these, these different fish and game agencies around the country start to wise up and recognize that, hey, you know, live beavers are more valuable than, than dead ones. And they begin to reintroduce beavers uh, to places where they were eliminated. Uh, in Connecticut and most of New England, really, uh, the beavers all descend from a, a reintroduction uh, in the Adirondacks uh, that was done in the early 1900s. Beavers were, were put back there and, and very quickly multiplied and, and basically spread uh, throughout all of, uh, all of New England again. Um, you know, California had a big beaver reintroduction program, Washington, Oregon, Utah, many states were, were bringing these animals back, uh, mostly using Canadian stock. Uh, of course, the most famous beaver reintroduction, um, which maybe you've heard of, uh, occurred in the state of Idaho in 1948. Um, at first, they tried uh, moving beavers 
back into the kind of the wilds of Idaho on horseback. Uh, the horses didn't take very kindly to having this, you know, big smelly rodent uh, strapped to their back. Um, so the next idea uh, was, well, it's, you know, it's, it's 1948, it's just post-World War II. So they've got all of these old uh, airplanes and surplus parachutes on hand. And uh, one of these Idaho biologists has the bright idea of airdropping some beavers uh, into, the, into the wilderness. Um, so that, that year in 1948, they, they released uh, 76 beavers uh, via parachute in these kind of special crates they designed. Uh, 75 of the beavers survived. One beaver, unfortunately, uh, escaped from the crate and, uh, and fell to his death, uh, very sad. But the next year when they flew back over this landscape and surveyed the area, they found ponds and wetlands in every single place where they dropped beavers. So this was actually a very successful project, uh, state of the art at the time. Nobody to my knowledge is, is uh, air dropping beavers into the wilderness anymore, but that was how they did it in the, in the mid 1900s. So, you know, all throughout the, the 20th century, you know, beavers are beginning to recover from the industrial fur trade and they're expanding their habitat and colonizing areas they used to occupy. Of course, the problem is that in their absence, we've colonized all those same areas, right? It turns out that good beaver habitat and good human habitat is basically one and the same. You know, we both like uh, kind of fertile floodplains and low gradient streams. You know, that's where beavers build their dams. And that's where we build our roads and power lines and railroads and towns and farms and, and so on. Uh, and when beavers and humans come into conflict, uh, you know, the, the results can be problematic. I would argue that, you know, that we're really um, the, the nuisance species more than they are, but there's no question they can be, they can be troublesome. Uh, here's a set of railroad tracks that I visited a few years ago uh, in Massachusetts um, with the beaver coexistence expert, Mike Callahan, who might be on this, this call right now. I think I saw his name. Um, and you can see the beavers had these, these tracks uh, pretty thoroughly underwater. Um, here's a, another kind of classic uh, conflict site that I visited in, in New Mexico near Taos. Um, and you can, what you can sort of see in this picture here, and you can see that the, you know, this cabin has been totally flooded. What you can sort of see is that the beavers, you know, they, start their, they start to build their dam up in the top left corner. They dam up to the porch of this cabin. Then they incorporate the cabin in their dam and then they continue on the other side. So, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be that landowner, but you have to admire the, the ingenuity of the beavers there. Uh, here's another kind of classic beaver conflict is damming in road culverts. Uh, you know, you sort of imagine that if, if you're a beaver, you know, the road bed is this fantastic dam. And then the culvert, the pipe, is the leak in the dam. And beavers hate leaks. That's, of course, their, their whole thing is plugging leaks. Uh, so when they, when they dam in a culvert, you know, the water rises, the road washes out. Very expensive uh, and time consuming to, to fix. That's a, a very, that's probably the most common um, cause of beaver conflicts in North America is, is road culverts. Um, but, you know, they occasionally get into uh, more creative mischief too. Here's a, a beaver that broke into a dollar store in, in Maryland and was browsing the plastic Christmas tree rack uh, when it was apprehended by the authorities. So they, they get into all kinds of interesting, interesting trouble. So of course, the way that these, these sorts of beaver conflicts are generally handled is by killing the offending beaver. And, the, and that makes a lot of sense, right? The beaver's causing a problem, get the beaver out of there. Uh, but you know, the issues with, with beaver trapping um, are, are manifold. Uh, I mean, one issue, of course, is that when you kill the beavers, you're you know, potentially eliminating that really wonderful pond and wetland habitat they're creating. But you know, the, bigger, the bigger issue, at least from a cost benefit standpoint, is that as long as the potential conflict, like that, you know, as long as that road culvert is still there, that's like a, a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, right? As long as the, the potential conflict still exists, the, the conflict is going to keep occurring. Uh, you know, every year we kill, you know, the federal government alone kills about 20,000 beavers uh, in the United States, and you know, private nuisance trappers kill certainly tens of thousands and possibly hundreds of thousands of beavers more. And, you know, I think that, I think that uh, a lot of those conflicts, probably most of those conflicts, um, could be handled in a, a much more ecologically sensible, sustainable, um, certainly humane way. Uh, here's, you know, here's one good example. Uh, so a lot of beavers get killed for, for cutting down trees, right? They cut down people's fruit trees or their ornamental trees or, or what have you. And I just don't think that any beaver should ever be killed uh, for, for cutting down a tree. That's just, you know, too easy a problem to solve. Uh, so here's a, a nice example in, uh, in, this is in Colorado, 
uh, at a, a site that I visited where uh, a land trust in Colorado had fenced off all of these beautiful old cottonwood trees that they wanted to protect from the beavers. Uh, and then they'd left unfenced the non-native Siberian elm trees, which the beavers then took down. So that's, that's invasive vegetation management uh, using the beavers as your, your control agent. I think that's a, a pretty cool uh, creative example of, of coexistence. I really like that. Uh, so when the when the the conflict is flooding, you know that's a, a potentially more uh, difficult problem to solve. But you know there too we've got options. Uh, this is um, what's known as a flow device. Uh, this particular model is called the, the Beaver Deceiver, built by this guy Skip Lyle, who's in Vermont, uh, and is another beaver coexistence expert. And uh, you know there are lots of different sort of variations on this this device. But basically, you know you run the pipe. Through the beaver dam, or through the, or into the road culvert, uh, and you know, and the the kind of the, the cages or fencing are there to prevent uh, the beavers from plugging up the pipe. And basically, the idea is that you know you're creating a leak, right? You're moving water through the pipe from the upstream side to the downstream side. Uh, so you can say, you know, hey. I like having the beavers here. Uh, I appreciate all the good stuff they do, um, but you know I don't want to have to snorkel through my backyard. Uh, and you can install one of these to basically drop that water level to a point that ideally um, is acceptable to both humans and and beavers. And uh, you know Massachusetts, Mike Callahan has found that these things are effective. You know, 85 to 95 percent of the time, so they work really well. Uh, and you know there, there's also a kind of a great cost benefit um, to them as well. Instead of having to you know trap out beavers from the culvert every single year for decades, you know, you, you put one of these things in once uh, and you've, you've basically solved the problem. So I think that there are thousands of sites all over the country that are currently being managed by trapping beavers where we could be using devices like this one to solve the problem non-lethally. Non and then the other, the other option for, for managing beaver conflicts that's not prevalent so much uh, on the East Coast just because you know, you've got lots of beavers on the landscape already, but that we do a lot of um, out West, especially in, in Washington State, is beaver relocation, right? As we, you know, we trap, we live trap um, lots of beavers uh, in places where they're causing problems and then we move them uh, to streams that don't have beavers and, and release them there uh, and kind of reseed a lot of these drainages and watersheds that historically had beavers, but don't have them today. Uh, so here's, you know, here's just a, a nice example of a relocation in progress. This is uh, Sandy and Chomper, um, and they're, they're bound for uh, their, their new home uh, up in the, the Metow Valley in, in North Central Washington. And uh, you know, every year in Washington State, you know, probably several hundred beavers uh, get, get relocated. And that's been a really important way to kind of repopulate a lot of these, these uh, really important drainages, these headwaters that once had beavers and, and don't anymore. Uh, and of course, the issue with beaver relocation is that, you know, beavers need their lodge and, and pond to feel safe, right? Otherwise, they get eaten uh, by, you know, by, by predators right away. And there, you know, and there have been places where, you know, beaver relocation has basically fed the local cougar population. Uh, so to, to prevent that from happening, now a lot of projects build these kind of artificial beaver lodges that the animals can move into right away uh, until they have a chance to build a, a better lodge of their own. And uh, here's the, the recent, the, the freshly re relocated beaver uh, enjoying his, his new lodge. And uh, in some cases, uh, different you know, nonprofits and state agencies actually build these kind of artificial beaver dams known as beaver dam analogs. Uh, you know, the idea being that those can you know, slow down some water and create these, you know, these kind of deep, nice pools and basically you know, turn a stream where beavers might not want to live uh, into a stream that's acceptable to them. Uh, and again, you know, allow them to, to recolonize some of these places that, you know, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't otherwise have them. Uh, and this is, you know, a very sort of cheap, low cost, low effort restoration te technique. Uh, obviously, the one potential uh, issue is broken fingers. So you gotta, gotta watch that, watch that sledgehammer. So, you know, I'm talking about all of these kind of elaborate um, beaver coexistence methods, you know, using flow devices and fencing and relocation and so on. I mean, why go to all of that trouble? What do beavers do uh, to the landscape that's, that's beneficial? You know, I know that I talked about some of their, some of their benefits to, you know, birds and moose and, and salmon and other species, but what about for us humans? What do, what do beavers do for us uh, that might be important? 
And there are all kinds of things uh, here. So, you know, certainly the, the, the biggest and, and most important one uh, in a lot of the country is they, they're really good at storing water, right? Uh, you know, this, I, I live in a very arid place, um, unlike, unlike most of you. And, and out here, you know, if we don't have beavers, we tend not to have water. Uh, here's a, a really nice example. This is kind of a classic case study in, in beaver history. Um, this is a stream in Northeast Nevada known as Maggie Creek. Uh, and you can see that, you know, due to a combination of beaver trapping and, and uh, unmanaged cattle grazing, you know, this stream is just totally obliterated. You can see that it's utterly lifeless. There's no vegetation. It, you know, the, the water is really shallow. This is just a kind of a, a cruddy stream, uh, very, very degraded. So in this case, you know, in the early 1990s, the, you know, the federal government and the local ranchers began to, you know, try to restore the stream. Uh, you know, they, they kind of fenced off some of the, some of the, 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 Creekside, so that cattle couldn't, you know, graze and and poop in the stream all all year round. And uh, you know, slowly the vegetation started to regrow. And then the beavers kind of magically showed up uh, in the early 2000s to to eat that that new cattail and, and willow resource. You know, nobody re nobody reintroduced beavers in this case. They just have this kind of magical way of finding good available habitat. So this is what the this is what the stream looked like in 1980 uh, when it was you know kind of crummy. The next picture I'm going to show you, uh, I took in 2017 in this, you know, more or less exact same spot uh, after you know, almost 20 years of beaver recovery. So just keep this picture in mind and then feast your eyes on this. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, so you can just look at this and say, okay, clearly this is a, you know, a healthier ecosystem uh, than this one. Um, but, you know, because there were scientists involved, they also quantified a lot of the changes. And they found that beavers added 20 acres of open water, right? So they're building dams, they're creating these ponds. That's, you know, great waterfowl, trout habitat, amphibians, you name it. Um, so that's, that's a, you know, a good obvious one is 20 acres of open water. Um, more interestingly, I think, is that beavers added three miles of wetted stream length to the stream. So what does that mean? Well, back in the, the bad old days, when it looked like this, that creek was so degraded that it was going dry before reaching its confluence with the river. So by slowing water down behind these dams, uh, beavers ensured that there would still be water in the stream come you know, August and September, the, the, hot, the hot dry season. So beavers actually took what was a seasonal stream and they made it a perennial stream. I think that's a really incredible story is taking seasonal water and making it year round. Beavers also added two feet to the water table. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, when you look at a beaver pond, you know, there's all of this visible surface water you can see, right? But what you don't see is the weight of that pond forcing water into the ground, rehydrating the soil, raising the water table, recharging aquifers. There's a huge amount of groundwater storage uh, at beaver ponds and actually much more groundwater being stored than surface water. Uh, and when you get all that groundwater, of course, that's really good for plants, right? So, so in this, in this case, you know, scientists detected an additional 100 acres of riparian or, or streamside vegetation. So beavers were irrigating uh, this entire valley at a really vast scale. And that's a big deal for, for this guy. Uh, this is James Rogers, who's a, a local rancher in, in Northeast Nevada. And you know, when I visited him, the point that he made to me was that beavers were increasing grass production on his ranch tenfold. Uh, and that means, you know, more weight on his cattle and, and more money in his back pocket. So now, you know, in Northeast Nevada, um, you know, a pretty, a pretty uh, conservative place, uh, there's this, you know, kind of wonderful progressive cluster of, of pro beaver ranchers uh, who've experienced the, uh, the benefits of, of beaver water storage. The other fabulous thing that beavers do that's really relevant uh, in, in the Northeast uh, is that they're really good at capturing pollution, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the stream's running along and it, it bumps into this, this beaver dam and the water slows down and all of the suspended solids and sediments and pollutants that the, that, that water column that is, is carrying along have a chance to settle out uh, and end up, you know, kind of trapped at the bottom of this, of, of the, the, the beaver pond. So beavers are capturing, you know, agricultural uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, they're capturing heavy metals from mining in many cases, pesticides, uh, you know, you name it. So there's all, you know, all kinds of studies showing that beavers have this really important, um, you know, pollution filtration benefit that's, you know, that's really relevant um, in, in Long Island Sound, certainly. Uh, and here's just one, one nice study uh, that found that just two beavers, a single pair of beavers, uh, captured 100 tons of sediment, 
15 tons of carbon. So they're, so they're sequestering uh, a huge amount of carbon, right? They're like old growth forests uh, in their ability to, to capture and store carbon and a ton of nitrogen. So beavers are, are these, these really, really valuable pollution filtration agents as, as well. Uh, another great beaver benefit that's, that's very relevant in the, in the Northeast as well is that they're really good at slowing down floods, right? This is a, uh, a beaver complex in Scotland that I visited uh, where beavers have been reintroduced after uh, a many century long absence. And, uh, you know, of course, Scotland, like, like New England, um, is a, it's, a, it's a rainy place and, you know, they've got uh, all kinds of destructive floods, especially due to climate change, which is, you know, making these intense downpours even, even worse. And, you know, beavers, by building dams, creating ponds, you know, they're slowing down water, they're storing it, they're, they're capturing it, they're spreading it out, and they're basically attenuating these big flood uh, pulses and, you know, really, really easing up on the kind of the downstream destructiveness. Um, so I think that's really incredible, you know, is that we've got these two polar opposite problems, flooding in the American West or flooding in, in the Northeast and, uh, and drought in the American West. And beavers, you know, on both sides of the continent are, are helping us tackle these polar opposite hydrological problems. That's, that's pretty magical to me is their ability to kind of regulate both sides of the hydrograph. And then the final beaver benefit that I wanted to mention that's, that's you know, so relevant to us here in the West is they're incredible firefighters, right? Uh, this is a, a great picture, I think, of, of um, this is a fire in Idaho. Uh, and you can see that all of the, the slopes, you know, the upland parts are just burnt to a crisp. Uh, and the only green, wet, blue, lush place on the landscape is this, this sort of beaver created valley bottom. Uh, so there's lots of, you know, or, or a, an emerging body of research um, showing that beavers create fantastic fire refugia, right? So all of the, you know, all of the animals can kind of congregate down here and, and ride out the fire in safety. And in some places, they're even creating fire breaks, right? So the, so the you know, the fire runs down to the edge of the wetland and stops in its tracks, you know, and can't continue on the other side. So beavers as firefighters, um, is, that's really increasing the, the kind of the interest in beaver-based restoration uh, out here in the, in the West. So given all of these, these wonderful beaver benefits, all the great stuff they do, why do we still kill so many of them? Why do we have such an, an antagonistic relationship towards beavers? And, you know, to me, I think it's a, a case of, of ecological amnesia. You know, when we killed hundreds of millions of beavers, we changed the land permanently and we've forgotten what aquatic ecosystems are supposed to look like, right? So now when we picture, you know, a healthy stream, we think about this sort of thing, a, a straight, free flowing, fast moving, you know, single thread channel with, you know, kind of a cobble bottom. This is the kind of stream that, you know, you would see in, in uh, you know, a fly fishing catalog or something. What we don't think about is a, a stream that looks like this, right? A kind of a sluggish, uh, slow moving swamp like environment with, you know, dead and dying trees everywhere. Uh, you know, this is not the stream that pops up in our imagination um, when we think about, you know, a healthy system. But, you know, in so many places, this kind of, of beaver created area was much more the rule than the exception. And, and for all kinds of reasons, as, as we've discussed, you know, this sort of system is, is in, in many ways healthier uh, than, than a, you know, a, an, un, an unbeavered stream. So I think that to fully embrace this animal and to bring it back in, in North America, uh, you know, we have to reconfigure our, our historical imaginations and remember what our land is supposed to look like. So to sum it all up, you know, we've got this fantastic animal uh, it provides us all of these wonderful services. It provides us for all of these wonderf wonderful services. It does all this work for free. And best of all, uh, it doesn't need permits. So, you know, as, the, as the, the mantra of the beaver believers goes, it's time that we stepped back and uh, let, the, let the rodent do the work. So with that, I'll say thank you so much and uh, happy to take any questions you may have. Um, I'll say that I, you know, I wrote, I wrote uh, a whole book about this stuff. If you want more uh, great beaver content and uh, I'd be happy to sell you a signed copy um, or you can check it out of your, your library too. Um, and here's, there's my email address in case you're, you're, uh, you're interested. So with that, thank you so much and uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Ben, given how many people are in the room. Uh, if you've got a question, please put it in the chat box. Amazingly, so far there are no questions because your talk was so incredibly thorough. <laughs> but, but please put, your, put questions in there. We've got a few minutes and Ben can happy to take some.
So far, you're only getting thank yous, Ben. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, my question is, are there any um, environmental or ecological groups that have sort of uh, taken the beaver as their symbol? Are they going to Washington or to their states, like in the state of Connecticut, uh, to the DEEP and fighting for beavers? I can't think of any. Yeah, there are some there are some great beaver groups out there. You know, I would say that the the, the kind of the certainly in, in in the Northeast, the leading beaver group is is the Beaver Institute, um, which was founded okay. by, by Mike Callahan, and that's uh, beaverinstitute.org. You can you can check that check that out, and that's got you know all kinds of great um, educational resources. Uh, you know, pamphlets about about how to coexist with beavers. Uh, it's sort of a wonderful clearinghouse for beaver research. Um, and uh, you know, and of course, Mike also does you know site visits and, and does uh, coexistence work all over the all over the Northeast. So I would check out the, the Beaver Institute um, as as uh, as a kind of a, a leading um, beaver group. But then there you know there there are also lots of you know sort of giant national environmental groups that do a lot of beaver work as well. So, you know, the, um, the National Wildlife Federation or the Defenders of Wildlife or, you know, even, even uh, NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, they, you know, they've, get, they've got sort of a, a, you know, a trapping reform program as well. So, you know, I think that, that there are a handful of beaver specific groups, but, you know, it's, what's just as exciting to me is, you know, seeing some of these multi-million dollar uh, NGOs also taking up beavers as, as, as their causes. Thank you, Ben. I really um, remind people to keep yourselves muted, but we do have a whole bunch of questions in the chat box now. So let me ask you a few of them. Uh, yeah. What can individuals do to help beavers? Yeah, you know, I, th I think that, that as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, really the, the biggest con biggest sort of conflict source um, is is road culverts, right? Damming and road culverts. That's where that's where a lot of beavers get get trapped. Uh, and you know, I think that there are a lot of um, you know, there are a, a lot of road crews and transportation agencies who, you know, who, who have these kind of long-standing contracts with trappers um, and, uh, you know, have never considered alternatives. And that's, you know, and that's really, a, that's an issue that, you know, can be influenced at a hyper-local level, right? You can talk to your, you know, your, your county commission or your town council or, you know, the local road crew or, or whoever. Um, and, uh, you know, and potentially, uh, you know, tell them to, hey, check out the Beaver Institute, uh, you know, talk to Mike Callahan or Skip Lyle or, or, you know, one of these guys who does who does coexistence work. And, you know, there, there are better options out there and there, there are really cost saving options, too. So I would I would, you know, figure out who's who's sort of controlling the the management of culverts in your area um, and, you know, and, and talk to who, whichever council or commission or, or agency that that might be. This is. Well, really, you've more or less answered this, but at the town level, what policies are they adopting to favor beaver? Yeah, you know, I, I wish I wish there were more towns that were adopting policies to favor beavers. But again, you know, I think that the that the, the best the best case studies all involve towns that that are implementing these flow devices, you know, these these pipe and fence systems, and managing conflicts that way uh, instead of contracting with 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 a trapper. Um, so, you know, trying to, to influence that to, you know, to solve some of these, these conflict, these recurring conflict sites non-lethally. Um, that's, the, that's the way to go. If beavers eat cattails, what about the areas that are being taken over by Phragmites? Yeah, quite that's the a question part there is, but yeah, that's a, that's a no. It's a it's a it's a good question, and I mean, you know, and there there are uh, you know, I've seen a, I've seen a few sites out here in Washington um, where uh, you know where where beavers had created you know a nice deep pond, and then the beavers left the area, the pond filled in, and created this kind of wet meadow that was then immediately colonized by Phragmites, right? So that you know, so so you know, I don't want to sort of sugarcoat the fact that beavers do occasionally create habitat for invasive species, right? For, you know, for these invasive aquatic weeds, you know, bullfrogs, uh, which are invasive a lot in a lot of the country, uh, you know, do well in, in, uh, in beaver habitats. So, you know, occasionally you'll get the, the, um, the undesirable beaver beneficiary, but, you know, just to, of course, reiterate that their, their biodiversity benefits uh, for native species far outweigh that, you know, the, any, any invasive connection. But I'm a shameless beaver apologist, so. You partly answer this, but I'll ask it. Uh, what beaver support groups exist? 
Yeah, there. You know, again, I mean, the, the you know the Beaver Institute in your in your in your neck of the woods would be would be the the best one. You know, out 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 west in California, there's a, a nonprofit called Worth a Dam uh, that does uh, you know beaver beaver restoration and advocacy and outreach. Um, so yeah, you know, Beaver Institute on the East Coast, Worth a Dam on the West Coast. Those are those are those are two great great groups. How does the pollution captured by dams affect the beavers? That is a really good question. One that is is basically unstudied, um, but you know they they do live in these incredibly polluted environments at times. Um, you know, I just I just got an amazing picture from a, uh, a Bureau of Land Management uh, biologist in in Colorado uh, who sent me a picture of of beavers. They they had dammed this old flooded um mine basically there's kind of this like you know this wooden um mining tunnel they built their dam in the mining tunnel and the water was the the, the ugliest nastiest color is sort of bright orange uh you know and, and she and this woman said that you know the 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 levels of arsenic zinc cadmium all of these heavy metals were off the charts uh and yet you know the beavers had been uh, living very happily in this in this mine, uh, you know, seemingly for years. So, you know, I, I don't want to say that there's that there's no impact. Um, you know, that I'm sh I'm sure that you know living in an environment like that can't be can't be good for you. Um, but uh, you know, it seems like they're they're capable of of handling some pretty uh, some pretty rough water. Could you, or do you have any more detail to explain the iron in their teeth, or how it works? Yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not a, a rodent dentist. Uh, I don't I don't know uh, I don't know it's, I don't really know a ton about about that. Um, but but the iron is derived from their food, right? So they you know they're eating all of these these different uh, you know plant species, and they're sort of you know, picking up different different compounds and 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 chemicals and nutrients from from each of them. And and you know that that iron basically comes from um, you know from one of their one of their their food sources, and and uh, they somehow incorporate that in sort of like the molecular structure of their teeth. So no, I don't know I don't know uh, as much about that as I should. Um, and now you've got me interested. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read more about beaver teeth now. One person that came in late wanted. I guess if you could repeat what they eat, and then a related question: Why do they eat hemlock? Yeah. So, um, so first, so that's interesting. So, so I I have never observed them eating hemlock. You know, that, that's that's not uh, you know again. So beavers are, you know, they they really much prefer deciduous trees, right? So you know, preferred food species. You know, they I mean anything in the poplar family. So that's you know birch. Uh, aspen, cottonwood. Uh, they love they love poplars. Uh, willow, you know, is another classic beaver food. Sugar maple is a good one. You know, they pick different oak species. Um, American beech uh, on the east coast is another another big big food species. So you know, they re they really like deciduous trees, um, which is not to say that they will never take uh, a, you know a conifer like a hemlock. I haven't observed that. I do see them eat um, cedar out here, which is you know not considered a, a traditional beaver food, but but they do. They do take that. Um, it's also possible that you know if you've if you've observed beaver cutting on a hemlock, you know it's possible that they weren't using that as a food source; that they were using that as construction material, right? Trying to fell that tree um, so they could then incorporate the the wood in their in their lodge or, or dam. So not to say that they would never eat a hemlock, but it's you know to to me the more likely explanation is that they're they're using that as construction material. Two home related questions: How long do they live in a lodge they build? Do they stay long-term or move on to build a new one? And can you explain how the Beaver Lodge is organized? Sure, yeah. So, so answer the first question. Uh, you know, it really depends on the, on the colony. You know, there, there are beavers um, that, ha that you know, remain in a lodge all their lives. So, you know, I, mean, I mean, there are lodges, you know, I, I visited a lodge in, in Massachusetts um, when I lived in, in Northampton. There was, there was one at a, at a lake there that uh, a, a local guy told me had been active since the, the 1950s. So, you know, generation after, gener after generation, all using the same lodge. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, but, you know, but then you hear about beavers, you know, that uh, actually create multiple lodges and, and actually move seasonally um, from, from lodge to lodge. And, you know, and then there are, there are colonies that, you know, that relocate uh, you know, every year, every couple of years, you know, perhaps as their as their food supply changes. Um, so it's you know it's really hard to generalize about beaver behavior. They they do all kinds of different different things. Um, oh, and the second question was sort of like how the lodge is organized. So, you know, the lodge there are basically underwater um, tunnels essentially that lead up and into the lodge. 
Uh, you know, the, the kind of the floor is covered in, in wood chips. Um, they're very fastidious. They're good, good housekeepers. Um, and of course, you know, the other thing to keep in mind that, you know, maybe I should have made clear in the talk is that, you know, beavers don't always build, you know, these big conspicuous island lodges like the one in that picture, uh, you know, in, in they're, they're very happy living in, you know, river or lake banks, right? I mean, the point of building the dam, you know, is to create a nice deep pool uh, where they can be safe. But, you know, if there's, if there's already deep water, you know, because they're in a big lake or a big river, um, you know, then, then they don't need to build a dam or a lodge, right? And they can just, they can just you know, burrow into the, into the bank and live, in a, and live in a bank burrow very happily. So they might, you know, so, so, you know, a lot, in a lot of places people say to me, well, you know, there, there are beavers, you know, there are, no, there are no beavers here because I don't see any lodge or dam, but in fact, they're, you know, they're just living in these very inconspicuous bank burrows uh, quite, quite happily. What comes first, the lodge or the dam? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's a, that's a that's a good that's a good question too. Um, you know, I think I think that in, in many cases it's, it's it's sort of like the it's like the bank burrow first, um, and then it's the dam to kind of impound water, uh, and then you know it's either expanding the bank burrow or creating a new um, housing situation. So yeah, I, I, that's that's a good question. What comes first, the lo the lodge or the dam? Um, yeah, you know, maybe maybe they're sort of working on working on both simultaneously. It'd be interesting to sort of yeah, watch a watch a new a new site be colonized. Do beavers mate for life? That's generally yeah, but not um, not exclusively. Uh, there there they there are there are there are beaver divorces that does that does happen, but they're 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 generally um, mate for lifers. How far will they travel to another? Water source, I assume, for making habitat. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. I mean, you know, the, so the, so so first, you know, they do occasionally travel overland. Um, they certainly don't prefer that, right? As I said, a, you know, a beaver on land tends to get eaten quickly. Um, but you know, I've I've read anecdotal accounts of beavers moving as 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 far as nine miles uh, over overland from stream to stream, you know, crossing ridge lines in the Rocky Mountains looking for for new water. Um, but that's certainly not their preference. You know, they they much rather disperse along the stream corridor. Um, you know, and in those cases, they can move a, a really long way, right? I mean, beavers, you know, they're very territorial animals. So if they're you know if if you're a two year old young dispersing beaver. Um, you know, you're trying to find a, a new territory that's not occupied by, uh, you know, by a couple of adults, right? Because beavers will fight and even to the death sometimes. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're a two-year-old dispersing beaver in an area that's already really densely populated, you know, you might have to go a, a very long way. Uh, I talked to a beaver biologist in, in Minnesota um, where, you know, the, there's a very dense beaver population and he, you know, he tracked uh, juvenile beavers dispersing as far as a hundred miles uh, along, along sort of connected water courses, um, looking for, for, for an unoccupied territory. So they, they can go a very long way, um, but, you know, then there are beavers who, you know, just go a half mile downstream from their parents' house and, and set up shop there. So again, you know, they're very sort of behaviorally diverse. They do lots of different things. A related question to your answer there is, can there be too many beavers in a single location? What's the right balance, for example, on a 50 acre pond? Yeah, you know, again, I mean, that, that sort of population density, how many beavers per, you know, per acre uh, really depends on, on the habitat, right? And how much food is, is available, that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I don't really, uh, to me, it's hard to imagine too many, too many beavers, um, you know, just, just because again, you know, we, we know um, based on historical accounts that, you know, these animals were, they were so densely populated uh, in, in North America, you know, and, and, and we see them in places where they're, where they're undisturbed by human trapping, um, you know, they're really colonizing uh, at, at remarkable densities. Um, so to me, it's, yeah, it's hard to imagine you know what? What too many beavers would look like? Just because that's that that uh, that happens. You know, we, I mean, there are just so few places where we're where we've we've achieved natural population density again. Um, you know, so I, I, yeah. I'm, again, I'm a, I'm a I'm a beaver apologist, but you know, I can't really imagine what too many beavers would look like. When relocating, is there a standard effort made to keep family units together? Yeah, absolutely. That's 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 very that's very important. Um, you know, of course, if you separate uh, a juvenile beaver from their from their parents, you know, the juvenile is almost certain to die. Um, 
And so you're you know, always trying to sort of live trap and relocate entire family units together. Uh, the issue, you know, is that is that sometimes the beavers that you trap will be those two-year-old dispersing beavers, you know, that are are looking for a, a territory of their own, um, you know, and end up in an in an irrigation ditch or a culvert or something like that. So in those cases, what a, a lot of projects do, a lot of beaver relocation projects do, is they try to find you know solo males and females, and then and then actually you know house them uh, together at some kind of facility facility, and and make uh, you know a compatible. Uh, couple and then move that that couple together like a little you know beaver dating service uh, you know the idea being there that that way you know when you move the couple together they'll settle down and start you know building a, a, a dam and lodge right away uh, and be safe whereas if you move you know one beaver by him or herself he would just go wandering off you know looking for a mate and probably get eaten by a, a bear uh, along the, along the way so yeah you're always trying to move beavers together uh, when possible what was the biggest lodge you ever saw? <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, you know, there, there's that, I had that, I showed that, that one picture, uh, the lodge that the, that, the, that the wolves settled in. That was a, that was a pretty, a pretty good one. Um, but, you know, they can, I mean, they can certainly be, uh, you know, 20, 30 feet in, in diameter and, and uh, you know, in well over uh, head height. Uh, I will say that, I, you know, I, I just got a couple, I just got a picture from a, a father and son in Montana uh, who found an abandoned beaver lodge and spent the night in there very, very happily in, in sleeping bags. So big enough to house a couple of humans. Well, I think I've covered most of the questions. Um, if you haven't read the chat, one might want to, particularly um, Mike Callahan in Connecticut, uh, certainly has resources that are helpful to people, particularly in Connecticut. Um, so unless anyone else has a really burning question, and if you have a really burning question at this point, you could unmute yourself. Thank, um, thank you very much. It was a great talk. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thank you all for, for joining. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see uh, Mike, Mike Callahan in the chat. Hey, Mike, if, if you have any, any beaver coexistence or management questions, the Mike's, Mike's Beaver Institute, beaverinstitute.org, that, that's, the, that's the place to check out. I wrote so that, that down. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. Well, yeah. It was great. Thank, Thank you, Ben. Thank you. We learned a lot. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. So you've got Hi, Ben. Just one question. Sure. Do, uh, do beaver, we have a, uh, this summer we had a beaver living and we have like the bathtub type pond that we built a couple of years ago. It looked like a young beaver living in it with a bank uh, home or whatever you want to call it. Now, we have not seen a single sign of it since it, this is upstate New York, um, since it got really cold and mm -hmm. snowy and the pond is frozen over. About 500 feet uh, away from us on another property is a huge beaver pond, and we're assuming that this beaver came from that pond. Uh, what, should we see sign of it in the winter or did it go back home for the winter? <laughs> yeah, who, who knows? You know, they, they move around in all, in all sorts of ways for all kinds of reasons. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know how, how deep your pond was, but, you know, but of course, look, a beaver, a beaver that lives in a pond that gets frozen solid uh, is, a, is, is in a lot of trouble. So it's, you know, it's possible the beaver didn't feel like the, the water depth um, was adequate and wanted to go find, uh, a, you know, another, another place to live. Um, you know, they, they, it, it, it might return at some point or a new beaver might show, might show up, but they, you know, they, they're pretty mobile, active animals. And, you know, you, I hear all kinds of stories about beavers, you know, okay. being in sight one season and then being gone the next. And, you know, we don't, we don't entirely know um, why, they, why they come and go when and where they do. Okay. But if it's still there, should, would you see some of it, sign of it coming up out of the pond to eat or whatever? Yeah, you know, they they are active all all winter. They don't they don't hibernate. Um, you know, they okay. in, in, in fall they assemble, but but you don't always see them because you know in fall they assemble a food cache, right? They cut a bunch mm -hmm. of material, they put it at the bottom of the pond, and then they spend the winter, you know, going from lodge to to food cache. Um, so they're not, you know, they're they're so they're not hibernating, but they but you you know you might never see them, um, you know, at the surface of the pond. 
Um, okay. You know, so I would just, yeah, I would just, you know, keep keep an eye on the on the, the vegetation and the, the trees around that pond. And you know, if, if there are if there are beavers still there, uh, you know, come come spring, um, you know, you'll you'll see you'll, you'll see, see sign of their of their chewing for sure. Okay, thank you very much. A great, great, uh, really good, good lecture. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Someone wanted to know earlier. Um, so, what got you interested in beavers? Why beavers? Yeah, why beavers? You know, uh, yeah, I, I, I grew up. I grew up in in New York. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time with my parents going to the Catskills and the Adirondacks. You know, the Adirondacks are probably that's probably the most beavery place. Um, you know, west or east of the Mississippi. Um, so, you know, as, as around them often, uh, you know, hiking, camping, and fishing as a, as a, as a child. So, I, you know, I always had a, an, af an, af an affinity for beavers. Um, and then, you know, in 2014, I think I, I was I was living in Seattle, um, and I, I saw a, a flyer for a beaver t for a beaver workshop, and I you know had no idea what a beaver workshop in entailed, but it sounded interesting. Um, and you know, I'm a journalist, so I thought maybe maybe there's a story there. And I went to this beaver workshop, and it was just you know it was two full days of all of these biologists and hydrologists, and you know and fluvial geomorphologists, all of these different scientists talking about how important beavers were, um, you know, for the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, and I realized that, you know, this animal that I'd always seen growing up and, you know, and thought was, you know, a, a pretty cool critter. Um, I realized that, oh, this, this is actually uh, an, an indispensable oh, animal. And there's a huge movement of people who are trying to bring it back. And that just seemed like an incredible story and uh, the, the, the genesis of the book. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ben. I mean, obviously, people love the presentation and uh, really, really appreciate us having you today. Yeah, thank you so much, Lawrence, and, and thanks to all of you for, for, for showing up and, uh, and happy, happy beaver watching this spring. <laughs> Great. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.